being invited. I'm very humbled by the people here. I'm not an expert in water. I've done water work over the years. Um, and so I appreciate people listening to me while we while I talk. And if you get up and walk away, I won't feel badly. Um, the, this project, um, this idea for Hong Kong, I've been here in Hong Kong for two years, arose out of a conversation I had with uh, the administrator of the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission a couple years ago in the United States. I used to be an Indian lawyer before I changed into a, I morphed into an academic. And the issue was, was water as it relates to mining in the Great Lakes region. And the issue of water pollution by, um, by local industries which have which discharge into Indian reservations, into territory that the Indians have claims to uh, under the common law. And so this, so the way uh, Jim and I talked about it, and the way I'd like to talk about it from a legal perspective is what does, how do we in fact uh, assert our policy choices in law? What is the basis of law? Because that in fact says how are we going to implement changes in policy. What sort of legal basis are we going to have? And so I just ran through, I don't even know how this works. Um, ah. So I just ran through a list of, um, of various legal sources for uh, assessing water allocation, water quality, and water quantity. And as you can see, there's, there's a constitutional basis for uh, who gets to determine what water uh, goes where, who gets what, what are the rules, and this, for example, would be navigable waterways in the United States, for example. Then there's regulatory and statutory uh, basis for uh, uh, monitoring, assessing water quality quantity, and these are based on either narrative or quantitative standards. Much of the Chinese law is a narrative law, as much of the law that for the Indian tribes was its narrative law. We will have, we will have policies that will produce the highest quality water uh, to be used for drinking. Um, for uh, these laws, can all can be national, regional, or local. The other one, which particularly interests me, is a, a property law. We don't think about property law affecting water quality, water quantity. But in fact, month of the discussion as we've had today already talks about in infrastructure development, mining, forestry. These are all really property law issues. Uh, in the, in the, the, in, and on my view, and as I, would, as I uh, would suggest coming out of this short presentation, is that these property law issues are, um, to deal with these issues and develop a mechanism between Hong Kong and the Guangdong uh, provincial and national governments is really going to be a key to solving a lot of these water quality issues. And one of the shortest problems we have here is we don't really have a mechanism to deal with these differing property uses and to resolve those things. Then, of course, there's common law allocation regimes. Uh, we know from out west in the United States, first in time versus reasonable use. There's Things like nuisance law, where somebody pollutes your uh, your lake or your stream, you can take an action against them. And then there's also the public trust doctrine, which is this notion that governmental entities regulating water supply, water quality, have to look to the needs of future generations and uh, in a developing area of law. There's a few other ones. Of course, there's contract, which is the basis of much of what's going on here in Hong Kong. There's contract, contractual obligations lead to various undertakings to preserve water quality and uh, allocation. There's use of fructuary rights and profits of prana. This is what I did when I was an Indian tribe, work for Indian tribes. Uh, you get to use property, you get to use water, even though you have no property interest per se. It's a use right. Customary law, local indigenous law. A few weeks ago, I was in Japan. Law, uh, the much of the irrigation of rice fields in the area I was in Japan was in fact 
done by local customary rules, who gets water, what fields get watered first, etc. Then of course there's treaties, uh, the Great Lakes uh, with the Canadian, Great Lakes Treaty between the United States and Canada, and international treaties which also are sources of law. Now the problems with these sources of law is that they feed into the issue of interjurisdictional problems, which is what we have. Because many times, interjurisdictional inter issues in law and in policy are between units, entities of government that don't have the legal basis to actually solve those problems. So one of the issues you need to do when you look at these interjurisdictional inter issues is in fact make sure that all the people are at the table which many times it's not the case and it leads to uh, a less than adequate uh, uh, dealing with the problem. So these are just a few of the problems that you, you have very quickly. It's self-evident uh, uh, allocation regimes, incompatible, incompatible land uses, upstream or allocations, uh, different development strategies. Uh, you can clearly see uh, the different development strategies that are happening in this area. Different water quality standards. Different environmental standards. This area is becoming, this is a particularly contentious issue in the Sacramento Valley in California. I was listening to the radio the other day and people are extremely upset about this issue there. Uh, supply dependence, enforcement, and uh, then of course a big issue with is the jurisdictions aren't coincident with water with water sheds. And this is a this is an issue that goes across the world. And uh, I before I came here I taught in New Zealand and they're trying to set up the jurisdictions on watershed bases, which leads to all sorts of very interesting population issues and political issues because people, even though they live in the same waterhead, don't really think that they have a lot in common. Uh, so um, this is already done. We've already talked about this. Uh, what I want to, what I, as what I became interested in this issue is, I was talking to Jim Zorn, and I wanted to see this water quality agreement, this what not quite this water agreement between Guangdong and Hong Kong, and it is not part of the public domain because within the the press, Guangdong undertakes to provide water quality and compliance with the latest. Chinese national standards for type 2 waters. That is an undertaking that is done as part of the agreement. Now the question is, is what does that mean in terms of what practical steps do you have, does Guangdong have to take? Does Hong Kong have anything they can do to ensure that this undertaking is taking place? If, and if it's not taking place, can, can the end user actually have some say in improving the situation. Um, now, these are the issues, that, again, we've talked about all these issues. There's no need to, to go on. But the fact is, is that the, the undertaking which, has, which, which Gondong has done, which they have, uh, the, the water supply meets the standards uh, as articulated. Nonetheless, they're looking into the future, there's going to be a continuing and growing problems. Now, this is a Hong Kong problem, this is a regional problem, and the fact is, is that this, this water, water agreement is being renegotiated now. Now we should perhaps look at this issue and look for a more combined enforcement and planning mechanism. Uh, within this contractual environment. Get everyone at the table. And uh, just a, a few things, and I think I am, I've got five more minutes. Okay. Um, the, the first thing that must be done, and we've talked about this, there's a Hong Kong solution and a, and a regional solution. But in fact, when it comes to water, there's really a solution where you get all the jurisdictions that have legal capacity on the issue to be at the table. And this, these, because of the economic development and the uses, changing uses in the areas, in fact, this is, in my view, a key element for land use planning. Integrated land use planning with Hong Kong in Guangdong 
having observer status, having some sort of say, other municipalities and jurisdictions within Guangdong having some say in land use decisions. And, and it's, it, you know, and, and we think, well, uh, it's, that's, a difficult, that's a difficult mechanism to achieve. Because it's one thing to have an observer status, it's another thing to have a sit at, seat at the table. For instance, just as, a, just as a, a matter of course, say there's a land use decision uh, that's adverse to the Hong Kong waters of the Dong River uh, in, in Guangdong. Can Hong Kong do anything about it? Well, uh, it doesn't look like they have standing under the Reconsideration, Administrative Reconsideration Act. It doesn't look like they have standing in court to even if they would bring a suit. Now, there is opportunities for uh, reciprocal judgments between Hong Kong and Guangdong, but there's no injunctive actions. It's only damages. So, in fact, there really is no remedy other than negotiation. Uh, it appears now. Um, these are some these things. There need we need to sit down and reconstruct this land use planning mechanism uh, to achieve a long term sustainable water supply for the area, not just for Hong Kong. Um, the other thing is, and I uh, bring in Zhang Xi. I'm sorry, my my uh, into the agreement. The other upstream, they should be in this agreement. It, it doesn't make any sense that all this development that we're seeing happening upstream here in this province, one, doesn't get any money, and two, they in fact could have more crucial impact on water quality than downstream uh, in some ways. Uh, we talked about these three and four. Um, we talked about five. Um, uh, six is part of the land use planning, and that is that there needs to be better enforcement of land use regulations and water quality regulations. And again, the better enforcement has to do with the more integrated approach to uh, these water quality, these actions that affect water quality. Right now, it's only negotiation, right? And I've already talked about administrative reconsideration. Um, uh, one mechanism which they could use to improve the enforcement is to get this is the this is the regulations concerning water quality protection in Guangdong. They need to make these not narrative standards because one of the issues I'm sure will come up has come up already. Narrative standards uh, they're good, but they're also able a lot of uh, a lot of jurisdictions can get around them. Uh, and finally. Uh, there needs to be uh, legal dispute settlement and enforcement mechanisms that are actually binding on the parties, which would mean some sort of revision of the uh, administrative procedures, land use planning decisions, and placement of, of various uh, industrial uses, logging in the provinces, and there needs to be some access for other municipalities. And I would, I would argue that you probably need the national government uh, and finally, nine, uh, this transparency issue, it's, I, we can't get the agreement. So here's something that's a huge amount of public sums are going to subsidize water quality. It's hard to get the actual agreement that's being negotiated um, and to be able to allow the public to have some sort of process and input into the process. But again, I, I, I look at it from a legal perspective, we really need we really need to get all the legal players, all the jurisdictions at the table and have a better enforcement and land use planning issues. Thank you.